Uh, I'm really uh, pleased to have been invited here tonight. Uh, pleased to see the turnout here this evening. I understand this is being uh, webcast, so I hope there are a lot of British Columbians or perhaps uh, uh, people further afield that are watching and listening in tonight. I thought I would start with um, a little story about uh, my grandchildren. I have three, but each and every August, the two boys, they're the older of the three, the set of three grandchildren. They live uh, six months of the year in the Yukon, sometimes on a trap line. And uh, in the, uh, the other six months of the year, they live in Colombia. And uh, their parents own a hostel in Colombia and a hotel, but they do spend uh, six months of the year in the Yukon. One of them is uh, the elder of the, the children, is my grandchildren, is a, is a bright little guy. And when he's with me, because I'm busy, uh, I'm an author of many, the many things I've done, I've authored a book, co-authored a book with a Vancouver writer, a former reporter with the Vancouver province, Suzanne Fournier. It's called Stolen from Our Embrace. It's about Aboriginal families and children and communities and the issues that are there. It's become a standard fare in most schools of social work. I think in many parts of Canada uh, where there are uh, uh, social work programs or counseling programs and there's an Aboriginal component and they need literature, they need information to share with the students for the students to examine and study. Any event, <clears throat> any event, these materials are always sitting around my, my townhouse in Chilliwack, and when I have uh, my two grandsons down with me, the elder of the two, Elias, is uh, one to sort of comb through things. And one day I noticed that he seemed to be quiet, and he seemed to be sort of looking uh, intently at one uh, page in a report that I had left sitting beside my computer. He said, hey, Grandpa, I have an observation for you. And I said, oh, you have an observation for me. He's like uh, 10 years old. And I said, what's your observation, Elias? And he said, um, I hope you don't mind me saying, but you're old for an Indian. <laughs> and uh, I looked down at him and I said, oh, yeah. Well, what makes, what makes you say that? And he said, well, I'm going through this information. And it says that Aboriginal males uh, on average live uh, seven to nine years, uh, nine fewer years than uh, their counterparts in the larger community. And uh, I said, oh, you've, okay, well, let me see that. And we looked at it together and I, I thought he might have been worrying. So I said, so what about that information concerns you, Elias? And he said, well, um, you're 67 now, Grandpa. And, um, Let's put it this way, I hope that you live as long as non-Aboriginal males. I hope you live as long as they do, that you don't leave us seven to nine years earlier than other grandpas, you know, leave their grandchildren. And so he's learning. <laughs> and I thought that was touching and I also thought it was amusing and I shared it online on Twitter and Facebook. and. I got a lot of, uh, or his comments rather, got a lot of laughs, uh, chuckles and the like. But um, even for someone as young as him, and a young Aboriginal boy, he's uh, now alive to this issue. Not as fully alive as some of us in the room, because we're adults. And certainly not as fully alive as uh, Dr. Jones, but who's an academic and uh, who has, thankfully, I must say, paid uh, very close attention, perhaps most, uh, more than any other uh, person from academia that I'm personally aware of anywhere in Canada, and I do a lot of reading. I read on average uh, one or two books every day. Most of them are nonfiction, but some, some books I read for, for purely amusement and entertainment. But I read a lot of nonfiction, and a lot of it is uh, academic studies of one type or another. And I was happy to discover there was someone around uh, like Dr. Jones. And he came to my attention, <clears throat> of course, <clears throat> through the news media. And what better way? And often as Canadian, that, Canadians, that's how we learn about important research, even if it's the beginnings 
of important research about important aspects of our society. And uh, Dr. Jones has uh, cast a strong beam of light on what I regard as a very important issue. Now look, <clears throat> I'm 67 years old. At one time, I was the, uh, I'm sure I was one of the youngest social workers in British Columbia, if not the youngest, back in the late 60s, early 70s. And um, I, I went through high school and then I went and undertook my studies as a social worker and graduated uh, in the early 70s. Some of you who are, well, there may be not many of you who are my age, but maybe, maybe one in the room, you might recall you, you, I was thinking of you. <laughs> Thanks for the, you know, volunteering there. Uh, some of you may recall that the age of majority in British Columbia changed from 21 down to 19. I believe it was in April of 1970. I was prepared to be a social worker before that date arrived. And um, when I went to what is now called the Ministry of uh, Children and Family Development in Kamloops and said, well... I've graduated and I'm a social worker, at least academically, uh, would you hire me? And they looked at me and they said, we'd uh, love uh, nothing better than to hire you, Ernie, but here's our problem. You're one of ours, meaning that I was still in government care. Remembering, remember, you were a, ch a child until you were 21 back then. And uh, more than that, um, you're not, you haven't attained the age of majority yet. So go away, and when you attain the age of majority, 21, come back and we'll hire you straight away. Well, things happened very fast, and within a few months, the age of majority went from 21 down to 19. So, of course, I jumped in my Volkswagen Beetle, you know, the people's car, and made, a, made my way over to Tronquil Road in Kamloops and said, <clears throat> well, I'm back, <clears throat> and guess what, I'm, a, I'm an, al an adult now and a qualified social worker, will you hire me? And they said, when can you start? And I said, well, you know what, I've rethought it. Um, I'm really not ready to go to work for you now because I have a contract to go to the northern part of British Columbia and work <clears throat> with a, an Aboriginal community that was being displaced by uh, a dam, the W.A.C. Bennett Dam in northern British Columbia. And uh, to make a long story short, many promises had been made to these people that uh, if they were to move, um, their graves would be moved, they'd have health care, they'd have education, they'd have housing, they'd have it all. All they had to do is move. And so they moved. But what they didn't realize is that people like that, uh, people who are from remote places, uh, I don't have the sort of, as it were, ur urbane, uptown sophistication uh, to look after themselves. Not having some of the basic knowledge that most Canadians just routinely have at their uh, disposal, their fingertips. Knowing that everyone in the province has a member of parliament, for instance, or a member of the legislative assembly. Those people at that time we're living in the modern world, but all their knowledge and skills was from 150 years earlier, right? They were not stupid. They were just equipped to live in a completely different world. And so they needed a seeing eye dog now. They needed somebody who knew about what white people do. <laughs> Uh, how they make decisions, who's in charge, how you make them do things. And they remembered me from the year earlier that I was, when I was doing a demographic survey. So through the RCMP, they invited me to the north and I went up there. And I only had five or six days with them. But I sat down with them and said, this is what you need to know. This is what you must know. To find justice for yourself to get the things that were promised to you that you never received. This is what you need to do. Do you know who your member of parliament is? Mem member what? <laughs> member of parliament, what's that? 
Do you know who your MLA is? MLA, what, what's that? Member of Legislative Assembly. Who are these people? Well, they're, non, they're non-Aboriginal people. They said, oh, you mean, uh, you mean white people? <laughs> I said, yeah, that's, that's who they are. Well, what we need to, go, to do is go and find them and bring them here. To make a long, circuitous story straight, we got the MP and the MLA to come and see them. I used the power of the press to get them there and made sure the press was there when they got there, the MLA and the MP. Well, you can bet, in a very short time, in that one week that I was there, things turned around quickly because stories were going to appear on CBC television, British Columbia and the Vancouver Sun. The MP stood up at that meeting we had out in the bush and said, I've never seen Canadians living in these conditions anywhere in Canada. This is a disgrace and it shouldn't continue. I promise you I'll go to Ottawa and I'll talk to the Prime Minister and turn this around. Who do you think the Prime Minister was then? Trudeau. Exactly. Trudeau Sr. And that MP kept his promise and so did the MLA. So the Department of Indian Affairs, the provincial government officials and others that had to know about these people to do their job, they now had that information about these people and they knew what their job was. And if they weren't prepared to do their jobs, the Vancouver Sun and CBC Television News was going to talk about how they weren't prepared to do their jobs. What do you think they did? (laughs) They did their jobs. Now, I don't know how many more minutes I have. Please signal me uh, when I'm taking too much of your, your precious time. I know it's precious. I don't mean that in any way sarcastically. I know all of us are busy. All of us have a limited amount of time. A lot of the challenges and issues facing Aboriginal peoples, uh, regardless of their gender, today are because... Aboriginal Canadians, with some exceptions, mainly in the urban environments, but not exclusively, are utterly unfamiliar with the political game. Yeah, there are some exceptions. You know, the national chief, the regional chief, the president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, Ernie Cray, the chief of the Chiam Indian Band, the advisor to uh, premiers and cabinet ministers. Ernie Cray, the guy that works sometimes in downtown Eastside with some of Canada's poorest people. Yeah, there are some of those people around. But you know, the people I'm talking about live in parts of Canada. And you know what? They live in places and under conditions. Many of them are really, in a real sense, inaccessible. They, they are on no one's itinerary. They are not on Prime Minister Trudeau's itinerary. They're not on the National Chief's itinerary. They're not on the Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs or Indigenous Affairs itinerary. They're not on the itinerary of the Vancouver Sun or Province. How do these people get their issues addressed? And so I've spent the better part of 46 years uh, traveling to these remote places in Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, northern British Columbia, to the Yucatan Peninsula. There are indigenous people there, after all. Uh, Working with people to show them the rudimentary things they have to do to get the things they want and are entitled to the very things that all other Canadians get as a matter of course. They're not getting special attention. They're not being put ahead of other people by virtue of their race. You know, this outdated concept that should have been on the uh, trash heap of history a long time ago. We still have it. Right? 
these outmoded things. I've got 10 minutes left, and I want to shift our attention to Aboriginal men and boys. I'm ever so grateful for the statistics uh, that Dr. Jones has provided to us. I realize much more research needs to be done. And the government of Canada has a role and a responsibility to aid in this research and support this research. And they shouldn't be allowed by Canadians like those of us in the room to blow it off, to let it go by. We shouldn't as Canadians. We shouldn't let it go by. Before I left my um, village, which is out near Chilliwack, there's 500 people, 250 people live on reserve. I asked my community members if uh, any uh, men and boys in our village uh, were killed and no one brought to justice where their deaths were concerned or went missing. In a matter of five minutes, they told me about five young men in the village and about others. So out in the hallway, I was telling uh, Dr. Jones that when the inquiry starts, and I do plan on making a representation there, um, I'm going to bring a box of death certificates from my community uh, with the community's consent, those that are willing to grant me their consent, and produce these death certific certificates of people in my community. I'm told it's a box full. And I was just saying to Dr. Jones and my friend there, Scott Clark, uh, my colleague Scott, that I hope it's a shoe box. But in, the, in, the, in that box, there are many, many names, death certificates for young men and boys who have died tragically sometimes in very violent circumstances, with no answers yet from the police. And in some cases, these deaths go back a couple of decades. As a chief of one community, given that there's a national inquiry going on and that focuses on Aboriginal women and girls, I'm sorry, I am not going to make an appearance there without referencing the men and boys in my community. And I'll make no apologies about it. And I'm going to walk into the room with that box of death certificates, and I'm going to put them in front of the commissioners, and I'm going to say, no, the death certificates here are not all that, are not all death certificates for, for uh, women and girls. Many are. But many are the death certificates for young men and boys for my community only. And before I make that appearance, I'm going to go to the 24 Stalo communities and see if each of them have a box full of death certificates that they might be willing to have me present, or they can present it themselves in front of this inquiry. You know, the way we are, uh, the way it is, you know, people have asked me uh, about the women and the success of their campaign. And yes, the families uh, who have a missing loved one got deeply involved, like me. I have a sister that was a, a victim of uh, Robert Willie Picton. And the Aboriginal groups and the women's organizations uh, here in British Columbia. We lobbied hard for the first inquiry here, and that was in British Columbia, headed up by former Justice Wally Opal. And from then, we went on and lobbied hard for this national inquiry. And all along the way, I've been getting messages on Facebook. I realize I have two minutes now. Facebook and Twitter, messages from family after family after family after family, apologizing to me, but they would like to raise the question of their missing son, or husband, or brother, or uncle. At one point, I was straight up with them because this is how I work, although I'm more often than not a very polite guy. I said, 
stop apologizing to me. Stop it now. Stop apologizing. You have every right to be indignant, to feel overlooked, to feel that no one is listening to you as parents. Do not apologize. Don't apologize to me. You need to stand up. You need to be counted. In our communities, we believe in spirits, spirits of people. And I've told my people and other Aboriginal peoples around British Columbia to put the spirits of your brothers, your dads and uncles at peace because they're crying out to you. You need to stand up and be counted for them. You need to insist that this young prime minister with the world's uh, best intentions and his cabinet and his minister of indigenous and northern affairs in an unapologetic way that you want aboriginal men and boys to be incorporated to be included in this inquiry why because there's not going to be another inquiry like this for another generation or more we can't afford to wait that long Canadians who want to see justice done. Aboriginal Canadians who want to see justice done need to learn to stand up and stop being so damn Canadian. Yes, politeness has its place, but people like Scott and I know that to get the few things we manage to get out of society and governments, and corporations, politicians, whether they're municipal, provincial, or federal, is we've had to stand up. We've had to tell them, as the uh, consultants say to these ministers, get their ask, you know, meaning of us, you know, you know, the Indians, get the Indians ask. What's their ask? <laughs> So I go in right away and I say, you want to know our ask? Here it is, and I tell them in no uncertain terms. But I make sure that I have ways of making sure they deliver on my ask. And one of the ways is through the media. That's true. The power of the World Wide Web, social media, cannot be underestimated. And I know there are probably Canadians, British Columbians, watching what it is we're doing and saying tonight, who know full well. If we want to get men and boys included in Squirry, we have to work together, we have to strategize together, we need to come up with approaches that are going to make Ottawa deliver. I don't want to wait another generation. So with that, my offer is, and I dare say my colleague there, Scott Clark, who is probably the best community organizer who works in impoverished places in Canada. He's probably the very best there is. We're going to work hard to make sure this is done. That data, information, the conditions, the circumstances of Aboriginal men and boys are addressed during this inquiry. And if they're not fully addressed in the inquiry, government is going to commit resources so that more research can be done, so we can learn more, so that policies that governments create in the service of Canadians, and in this case, Aboriginal men and boys, are better than they are. And let me tell you right now, they're very shabby. Very shabby indeed. So either we're into this, Either we're going to do something about this or we're not. I may have to work with Scott and try to do it ourselves with our supporters, and we have more than a 1,000 in, in Vancouver alone. And we've built a provincial organization to work with our people that live off-reserve and in urban areas across British Columbia. We've got busy. We've done it. And just this past week, Scott was in uh, 
Hall, Quebec, and we applied for and received uh, a, a, a official standing with uh, what is called the Indigenous People's Assembly of Canada. So now we're going to have a national body that we can work with. We're willing to work with academia. We're willing to work with Dr. Jones. We're willing to work with your organization at SFU. I've already started working with Stand Canada. They invited me out in January to UBC. This is the international uh, youth group that fights against genocide around the globe. They had me come out to say, what can we do, Chief Cray in Canada? And I. And if you want to know what I told them, word for word, it's on YouTube. When I spoke to them out at UBC. And I gave them insights uh, into the work I've done in the past and how it is that I get these things done. Not alone. I do have colleagues like Scott and, and others. So with that, let us uh, tonight commit ourselves to making these changes working together on making these changes and making people snap to attention. Why? It's a democracy. <laughs> this is not Russia, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. It's not Syria. No one's going to come and shoot us for speaking out. We're free to do these things. We're free to have these opinions. We're free to de make the demands that we want. We pay the bills. <laughs> it's up to us. So with that, I, um, I want to thank you uh, again for inviting me here this evening. When I make a commitment to work with groups, I follow through. And so does my colleague there, Scott Clark. We work together and we follow through on the commitments we make. So we're committed to make this change for men and boys. And it's uh, a lot of issues around men and boys. Yes, for Aboriginals, but uh, men and boys generally across the society. Uh, if I'm ever invited, invited back, I have much more to tell you, but I think perhaps that, that's enough for this evening. So once again, thank you so kindly for having me here this evening.